Well, welcome to this video on the subject of shock. Now, when we use shock in the clinical context, we've got to be fairly precise about the definition. So we're using exactly the right term to describe exactly the right condition. And what shock doesn't mean in a medical context is that someone's had a fright or that they're suffering from some acute post-traumatic stress disorder. That's more a psychological phenomenon. Now, I'm not saying that these psychological phenomena cannot be very serious, debilitating, even life-threatening, but they're not what we mean by the term shock. When we're talking about shock, we're talking about a state of reduced tissue perfusion. Shock is about circulatory failure. The circulatory system is no longer functioning as it should. So what we've got here is kind of definition of shock. So we're talking about a state, it's a clinical state, with reduction in systemic tissue perfusion. Systemic means the tissues of the body. So there is a reduced amount of blood going through all of the body tissues. There is a reduction in systemic tissue perfusion in shock. So what? Why, why does this matter? Well, it matters because perfusion is necessary to deliver oxygen to the tissues, to deliver nutrients to the tissues, and to remove the waste products of metabolic processes from the tissues. If there's not an adequate circulation, the tissues will become hypoxic, they will become malnourished, and they will start to be poisoned by, by the accumulation of their own toxins, which are not washed away in the blood. So this matters because it results in, resulting in decreased delivery of oxygen and the reduced removal of waste products. And eventually, this will damage the tissues. It will lead to tissue injury. Now, in other talks in this series, you've seen a diagram probably something like this. We have an arterial blood supply. Arter is divided into smaller arterial vessels. And these arterial vessels supply areas of tissue with blood. Because they supply them with blood, they're also supplying them with oxygen, of course. So the arterial blood will come along an arterial branch, divide into smaller arterial branches, into progressively smaller arteries, then into arterioles. Then the arterioles will take the blood into the capillaries, where there will be gaseous exchange between the blood and the tissues. The oxygen will go from the blood into the tissues. Carbon dioxide, which has been produced by metabolic processes in the tissues, will diffuse from the tissues back into the blood to be transported away in the venous circulation. So this is what's happening normally. But in shock, there's not enough blood going through the tissues. There is a reduction in systemic tissue perfusion. This means the tissues which are supplied by these arterial branches will become hypoxic. There will not be enough oxygen getting to them. Also, they're going to produce waste carbon dioxide. And when, when there's not enough oxygen getting into the tissues, the metabolism of the tissues changes. Now, when a tissue is well oxygenated, it produces energy using what is called aerobic respiration. Energy is produced using oxygen. But then if the tissue becomes hypoxic, that metabolism changes. It doesn't stop altogether, but it changes to become anaerobic metabolism. Metabolism in the absence of oxygen or in reduced concentrations of oxygen. And when anaerobic metabolism occurs, lactic acid is produced as a waste product. So these tissues become hypoxic and acidotic. The acidosis will actually start coming out of the tissue to some extent. And in established cases of shock, that will cause a uh, systemic acidosis. But initially, the tissues are going to be hypoxic and they're going to be acidotic. Eventually, that will result in damage to these tissues. So we see that blood pressure is necessary to push blood 
through the systemic arteries. Now, the reason that I'm able to talk to you at the moment is that my heart is generating a systemic blood pressure. That's pumping blood up my carotid arteries and my vertebral arteries, and the blood's going around my brain, and my brain is being oxygenated. That's why it's able to function. If there's not enough oxygen going up to the brain, it'll become hypoxic. So it'll become hypoxic if there's not enough perfusion, because the oxygen, of course, travels in the blood. So my brain is being perfused at the moment, therefore normal metabolism is able to carry on. But if there's not enough blood pressure, then the blood will not be circulating around my brain, it won't be getting the oxygen, it won't be removing the waste products, and it won't work. It's the same for all my other organs. The reason that my myocardium is able to function at the moment is that blood is perfusing the coronary arteries. The reason that my kidneys are able to function at the moment is because blood is going through my renal arteries. And the only thing that's pumping the blood through the arteries is the blood pressure. So it's dependent on blood pressure. We need blood pressure to maintain systemic tissue perfusion. So to understand shock properly, we need to understand what we mean by the term blood pressure. So let's now go on and define what we mean by this term blood pressure. And blood pressure is determined by cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance. Now, cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped out by the left ventricle in a one minute period. And at rest, it might be in the order of five litres of blood per minute. But that cardiac output is itself dependent on two factors. So the cardiac output itself, the volume of blood pumped out by the left ventricle in a one minute period, the cardiac output, that is equal to heart rate. That is the number of times the heart is beating per minute, the number of contractions, and stroke volume. And stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out per cardiac contraction. So, for example, you might have a heart rate of 70 beats per minute and a stroke volume at rest of, say, also about 70 mils of blood. What this means is the heart is contracting 70 times a minute. Each time the heart contracts, the left ventricle is ejecting 70 mils of blood into the systemic arterial circulation. And you can see from this that that's going to give you a cardiac output. In this case, that would equal 4,900 mils of blood being pumped out per minute. As we said, it's around about, around about 5 litres in an average-sized adult at rest. So cardiac output, the amount of blood pumped out by the heart in a one-minute period. That's going into the, arteri into the arterial into the arterial vessels, it's being pumped into the arteries under pressure. So that's going to contribute towards arterial blood pressure. But there's another factor here, and that's peripheral resistance, sometimes called systemic vascular resistance. And this occurs because the arterial system, particularly the arterioles, are able to vasodilate and vasoconstrict. Now, when the arterial vessel, vessels vasodilate, that's going to reduce peripheral resistance. And if it reduces peripheral resistance, it will reduce blood pressure because blood pressure is determined partly by peripheral resistance. However, if the arterial vessels constrict, if there's a vasoconstriction, that's going to increase the pressure in the arterial vessels. It's going to squeeze down on the blood increase the pressure, so you increase peripheral resistance, that will increase blood pressure. So blood pressure is determined by those two factors, cardiac output and peripheral resistance. But we notice here that cardiac output is dependent on venous return. Now what do we mean by this? Well, blood is coming back via the large veins all the time to the heart. And when the blood comes back into the heart, it's going to fill the heart up. And as the heart fills up with venous blood, 
the walls of the heart will stretch. And there are stretch receptors in the myocardium. It knows how much it's been stretched by the blood which comes into it as the venous return fills the heart up again, ready for the next contraction. So if a little bit of blood comes into the heart, it's only going to stretch a little bit. That means it doesn't need a very big, powerful contraction, so there'll be a smaller contraction next time. But if the heart fills up with blood a lot, and it's stretched a lot, you need a more powerful contraction to eject the, say, to eject the blood out of the ventricle. So cardiac output, the contraction of a cardiac, of a heartbeat, depends on how much the ventricle is stretched. In other words, cardiac output is determined by venous return. So if there is a reduced amount of venous return, there's going to be less cardiac output. If there's an increased amount of venous return, there's going to be more cardiac output. Another way to put it is that cardiac contraction is determined by cardiac stretching, or myocardial contraction is determined by myocardial stretching. This is to make sure that cardiac output is equal to, and indeed is determined by, venous return. And you might recognise this as Starling's law of the heart. So the cardiac output can only be maintained if there is adequate venous return. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to add to this definition. Blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance in the presence of adequate venous return. So this gives us a, the equation here, blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance if there is adequate venous return, in the presence of adequate venous return. Now the reason I've emphasised this equation is this equation can be used to explain all of the clinical forms of shock. For example, if there's a reduction in cardiac output, that will reduce blood pressure because cardiac output contributes towards blood pressure. Or if there is a reduction in peripheral resistance, as a result of vasodilation, that too will reduce blood pressure. Or if there is inadequate venous return, that will reduce cardiac output, which of course will reduce blood pressure. And in shock, the blood pressure is going to start to be reduced and that will reduce the perfusion of the tissues. So if cardiac output falls to such an extent that the tissues of the body are no longer properly perfused, then that patient would become shocked. If peripheral resistance falls to such an extent that the tissues of the body are no longer being properly perfused with blood, that patient would become shocked. If there's a reduction in venous return, maybe because the blood's leaking out of the body somewhere and not getting back to the heart if the patient's bleeding, that reduction in venous return is going to reduce cardiac output and that is going to reduce blood pressure. If it's reduced to the point where the tissues of the body are no longer being adequately perfused with blood and oxygenated, not removing the waste products, then that becomes shock. So shock can be caused by reduced cardiac output, reduced peripheral resistance, or reduced venous return. And these three factors explain all of the clinical forms of shock. Now, shock is described by its cause, and there are different clinical forms of shock. So when we look, about the, look at the clinical forms of shock, we're not only looking at the clinical forms, we're looking at the causes of shock all combined. And that's what we want to do next.